So today, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our our speaker, who is uh, Sean Molesky. Sean Molesky is a, a, we would call it a young professor, and I think I can afford to say so, because there is a certain age difference. And uh, as uh, we have seen in principle, uh, the uh, RQMP seminars is also a great forum for our colleagues from the university who are members of the RQMP to also start talking and talking about their research because it also makes uh, uh, our colleagues within RQMP and the, the community aware of where they are going, what they are doing. And many of them actually uh, become members of the RQMP, which is indeed uh, the case of, of Sean. So, uh, uh, everybody has to work hard for that, not in that comes for free. Uh, these days, even in the age of uh, quantum computing, we still have some problems when starting the presentation today, right? So, uh, continuing to introduce Sean, uh, Sean has received his uh, PhD and uh, degrees from the University of Alberta. So he finished his PhD with the governor's gold medal in 2017. And then he pursued uh, uh, his career by spending some time at Purdue University and then uh, three or four years at Princeton University before really deciding and uh, being uh, attracted by Polytechnic Montreal. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, transition from Purdue to Princeton and finally to Polytechnic. So today he will share with us his uh, wisdom on a dual outlook for inverse design, which indeed is uh, part of his uh, activities, which is related to photonics, to uh, um, computer modeling, and uh, inverse design, as we would say. So Sean, the uh, podium is yours. All right. And I hope that there won't be any technical uh, computer problem. It's only a human computing. <laughs> so oh, thank you. Yes. I guess I, yeah, I have a thing for peas. I'm not, I'm not sure. But anyways, okay. So thank you very much for having me today. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. The title of my talk is A Dual Outlook for Inverse Design. And right off the top, I'm going to say that, well, okay, I kind of oversold this a little bit. All of my examples today are going to be in nanophotonics. Although the theory that I'm going to present, I think, is much more broadly applicable, the specifics that I'm going to talk about are related to one kind of problem in nanophotonics, the problem of choosing whether or not a point has material. So this is a highly relevant problem for nanophotonics because usually we don't have that many choices for realistic materials that we can use because we want to do collaborations, because we want to actually build real things. There's only a few materials that are probably sensible. And from these sensible choices, the thing that we can do is we can structure it in interesting ways to try to get different characteristics out of it. And the structuring from a design or optimization perspective can be reframed as the problem, the decision problem, of trying to choose whether or not a point has material. Or where is the boundary? You can rephrase this in all kinds of different ways. If you don't work in this field, haven't uh, thought about nanophotonics in a long time or ever, try, uh, <laughs> I would encourage you to try to think about how similar decision problems occur in some area that you're interested in. Because I think if you do any kind of engineering at all, most of these problems are related. So whether or not you want to choose, uh, strength of coupling parameters, can, can this be optimized? What you actually control in most situations is some kind of decision. And um, because of that, most of what I'm gonna to say today is quite applicable. All right, so with all that said, within nanophotonics, we have this problem of trying to choose whether a point is occupied by a material or not. And, when you approach things from this perspective, then all design kind of becomes optimization. The question of what kind of characteristics can I get? So I'm here showing one of the kind of classic problems in nanophotonics is that I have a radiating dipole source next to some object. So I have this bounding volume and then within this bounding volume, 
I can make any kind of shape I want out of some material that's defined by susceptibility. And then I want to control different things about the characteristics of this phenomenon. I want to control maybe how much power is radiated. So I want to enhance the emission uh, going out into free space of the dipole. Maybe I want to control how much radiation is absorbed. Interactions of uh, dipole with the structure. This is kind of our basic building block. With this framework, we can describe all sorts of problems that occur in nanophotonics or many of the different things that people are interested in. So we can define confinement, things that happen in photonic crystals, for instance, by trying to limit the density of states or trying to enhance the energy and the feedback. Energy. Uh, radiative enhancement, kind of just as I said, obscurance by trying to say that a field interacts with a body that would otherwise cause scattering, but I introduce some kind of material boundary that now the input and the output fields are actually the same. By the same kind of reasoning, I can also talk about coupling problems or communication problems. I can talk about light trapping as trying to get the maximum absorption within some volume, trying to maximize the energy into some object that I engineer. I can think about sensing as some kind of dynamic property. Um, how much can a molecule change the characteristics of my environment? I think about lensing in terms of different incoming angles and trying to maximize the intensity or other related quantities. I can think about optical forces. So these kind of things and more, I can all frame them in terms of the idea as I have some kind of objective that's described in terms of my fields. I want to optimize it. So I want to maximize it, minimize it. And this optimization is subject to the constraints of real physics. So the constraints here of electromagnetism could be other physics. This idea of uh, once, you, once you say, okay, it's an optimization problem, all these things kind of share this unique characteristic. But once it's an optimization problem, why can't I get a computer to solve it? This is more or less the idea of inverse design. Um, mathematicians may disagree a little bit about what we're calling inverse design, but for our purposes here, this is inverse design. And you can really think of it as taking these engineering problems, spreading them as optimizations, and trying to get the computer to solve your optimization. And this <coughs> protocol has been gaining a lot of steam, especially within the past 10 years or so. so. This slide is already getting a little bit old, but these now, these kind of computational approaches to maximizing, optimizing nanophotonic phenomena have really been improving rapidly um, as computers are getting more powerful. And the kind of interesting structures that they come up with are reliably outperforming the things that we think of. So the kind of structures that we would come up with tend to be very high symmetry, um, kind of simple structures. And for various reasons, these tend not to be ideal for nanophotonics. So a couple of examples of why this happens. So one is, is an older one from uh, my boss's group about second harmonic generation. The kind of standard way to think about second harmonic generation is that I want really high intensities. I want really high intensities in my fields at my um, fundamental. This is what drives the polarization of the second harmonic. And this in turn is what will create my second harmonic field. So from an anaphotonic perspective, this means that I want cavities that have really high quality factors. I have a high quality factor cavity, then I get really high intensity. I get large amplitudes to drive on the near effect. Well, when we put it on a computer, it tells us that actually this is not a great approach. Um, why is that? Well, the really high Q cavities that we design very often tend to be related to some kind of symmetry. So it might be some particular mode having some kind of symmetry maybe within a symmetric structure. And then if you look at these modes at different frequencies, well, usually they'll have different translational symmetries, which means that they're almost completely orthogonal. So if you're trying to engineer second harmonic generation between two modes in one cavity for two different frequencies, one uh, half of the other, the chances of getting kind of asymmetric modes that have a nice overlap that would give you a strong uh, second harmonic generation is very small. With the computer does instead is it actually makes very weak cavities uh, or it has a cavity that has 
I guess it's one cavity in a way at the two different frequencies. And it's a uh, very, very small values for, for the quality factor, so low amplitudes. But the two different modes at the fundamental frequency and the second harmonic frequency have a really high modal overlap compared to what you would see in kind of standard generation or what most people would think would be good design for generation. So um, computers come up with different ways of approaching these problems. That's interesting. <laughs> Uh, a second example, this one is taken from some work we did with Jaime Fu's group at the University of Washington. Here we're trying to get back to this classical nanophotonic problem of trying to get as much radiation out of a dipole as possible. So this might be interesting for some kind of quantum memory applications. Here we're thinking about an MV center implanted in a diamond substrate. And then on top, we're allowed to do some inverse design in terms of an extractor. So we're allowed to, to build this kind of extractor on top to enhance the interaction of this NV center with coupling light so that we could control the NV center. Uh, we come up with this funny shape. What's interesting about this? Well, if you were to ask me how to do this problem, I would probably tell you, well, the thing you want to enhance is density of states. Density of states is kind of a catch-all for the interaction strength of the electromagnetic field at the position of the dipole. And generally, this is a good quantity to, to optimize because if you have higher interactions, well, that's great. You probably have higher interactions with everything. The more tricky objective would be to actually think about maximizing radiation. This is a lot harder because it's very difficult to think in terms of the field patterns that you would actually need to get outgoing radiation. It's much easier to just say, well, the density of states, this is an easy quantity. It's just given by the magnitude of the electric field for the inner product of the electric field and the point dipole. That's, that's something easy to do. It's probably a good approximation. The harder thing to do would be this, this field quantity. And I would say, okay, it's not gonna make much of a difference. What the computer says is yes, it does make a big difference, uh, especially when the distance to the interface is larger. So here you see we have two kinds of, we, we did two different kinds of objectives. So either this kind of simple LDOS objective. So these are all the circles. And then the kind of more correct flux objective, which is all the squares. This one would be much harder to think about for, for a person. Um, why, why would a structure optimize flux? It's, it's a lot harder to think about in terms of the dipole emitter. And we see that when we actually make the, the optimization work for the flux enhancement objective, these are the red curves, it does something completely different than when you tell it to optimize for LDOS. So when you tell it to optimize for flux, you see it does a much better job <laughs> in terms of the flux enhancement. Uh, and it actually does a very poor job in terms of LDOS enhancement. And if you tell it to work for LDOS, well, the answers are set kind of somewhere in between. It doesn't give you as much flux as the flux objective. And the answer is when you're at a distance to the interface above, say 100 nanometers or so, are actually kind of shocking. So, very big differences in terms of the specific thing that you're looking for. So I guess lesson number two is the computer can actually think in terms of fields. So telling it to do exactly what you want it to do is a good idea. And this is also interesting for the design perspective because this is another thing that we are not really capable of doing in most situations. Usually electromagnetic fields are too complicated to, to picture. Really only think in terms of these very simple objectives accurately. Okay, so I've, I've told you some of the, the nice points about this idea. What are some of the issues? Well, once you start doing it for a while, uh, there's definitely things that crop up all the time that are that are rather annoying. So the first and kind of the fundamental thing is that the relationship between the structure and the properties is non-convex. So for the purposes of this talk, it just really means it's, it's very complicated. It's a complicated relationship that can't be linearized in any kind of nice way. And because of this, we can't globally look at what kind of characteristics should be ex expected. The problem of choosing whether or not doing this decision problem, does this point have material or not, is part of this NP hard class, or at least that's what we believe to the best of our knowledge. And because it's part of this NP hard class, it kind of means that when you make your problems bigger and bigger, there cannot really be an efficient algorithm 
to solve these kind of problems. And that leads to all sorts of issues. Uh, the main one is that we don't know what we should expect. So sometimes using inverse design on these objectives gives us answers that are much, much better. Our performance goes up by factor of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 3, something like that. Other times we try it, we try different algorithms and nothing much happens. So then the question becomes, well, is this something we're doing? We're just not looking at the right algorithms where we're kind of seeding it the wrong way. There, there's something else we need to do. Or is this something fundamental about the physics of the problem? And in most cases, we don't know. And this gets into the issue of what can we promise an experimentalist. This gets into the issue of if we, if we are thinking about new technologies, well, you know, can we count on, on components improving anymore? Can we say, you know, this technology could work if only I could get a factor of four or a factor of 10 better performance out of this component, then maybe I could get the fidelity I need or whatever one algorithm. Is this possible? And from just a more, I guess, day-to-day uh, -day perspective, it raises this question of when an algorithm should stop or kind of when is your work done? When have you explored enough to say, okay, I know that this problem is, is not solvable or I should stop my algorithm now. I don't need to let it run on take all these computational resources. Uh, the other aspect is what are we exactly learning? Uh, when we write these programs, they're not exploring the global landscape. So when they come up with an answer that's better, is this something fundamental? Is this is this new structure worth you know thinking about, thinking about why, why it does so much better? Or is this just another example of some other structure that's good? Maybe there's uh, another option down the road that's going to be much better. Maybe this thing is going to be replaced in, in two years. You don't know. So kind of uh, condense this onto a diagram. What has happened with inverse design or computational design is that we've, we've gone above what we can do intuitively, generally. We do much better. Uh, so there's just kind of no scale on this purposefully because it varies from problem to problem. But computational design is doing a lot better than what we can think of with some kind of high symmetry structure, understandably. But we don't know how it relates to optimality. So we don't know if these computational design structures are actually good or they're just some other structure, these kind of designs. And trying to reduce this gap between what we know in terms of optimal performance and what we know in terms of computational devices is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk. The idea boils down to two kinds of different relaxations on our problems. So we always have this idea of optimization in mind. And at the start of the talk, I said our optimizations are about choosing, making some choices subject to constraints that physics are true. Well, one of the ways you can get a bound on an optimization problem is relaxing some of your constraints. So if I, if I take that optimization problem with more stringent constraints and I compare it to an optimization problem with less stringent constraints, it's kind of obvious that the one with less stringent constraints I can always do better. That will always give me a bound. And so if I can solve the optimization problems with less stringent constraints exactly, that, that's one way to get this optimality information. So our first kind of relaxations is very much motivated by the way we solve these problems computationally. And in our group, we've always done these volume integral equations. And the idea behind volume integral equations is kind of you take these little cubes, you discretize your, your domain into some small set of objects. And if you make these, these small cubes small enough, then if you look at electromagnetics, if you do it at a given frequency, there's always kind of some, some area of cutoff. The, you don't need to describe physics down to precision zero. There's always some kind of characteristic length scale related to your Green's function, related to your source, that beyond which there is no response in your problem. So kind of like a ultraviolet cutoff. And based on this cutoff, you can get away with modeling things in terms of discrete elements. You can say, I don't actually have to, to go down to a continuous description of, of my field. I can say that my field is actually this sum of discrete things. It's kind of like pixels or voxels. And this is a very accurate representation of physics. Well, if this is true, 
what happens when we start making this cube bigger? Well, we know that at a certain point, it's not going to describe the, the physics of the problem completely accurately, but it still does capture a lot of the important characteristics. So as we keep growing this box, what happens is that in reality, our physical field might fluctuate in the volume, but we can still enforce that on average, physical constraints are true. So it's kind of like in this larger box that I've shown up top here, I might have these, these fluctuations of positive and negative violation of my physical constraints. So this is kind of like if I wrote down Maxwell's equations, I would see that the two sides don't balance, that it's not an equality like you want. But on average, over this entire uh, cuboid sort of thing, I guess it's not a cuboid, it's some kind of rectangle thing, there is no violation. And because there is no violation on average, I end up capturing a lot of the important physics about the problem anyways. And so this is a way that I can get away with using much fewer constraints and hence make my problem a lot easier to solve while still retaining a lot of the physics about this optimization problem and looking at the performance. This is kind of a, a little brief interlude before I talk about the second relaxation. Not crucial to, to our discussion, but helpful is the idea of scattering theory. So we're gonna use scattering theory in, in the equations that pop up after this. So just as a brief refresher, the idea of scattering theory is kind of to build off your knowledge of some kind of background solution. So maybe this is a solution in free space, maybe it's a solution for some specific geometry. It's to take this background solution and to use that background solution to kind of build up your knowledge for a general environment. So in this case, uh, I've drawn this potatoid. I think I modeled it after a pair. And we have some initial current. And the idea of scattering theory is that, well, at least in terms of electromagnetics, this dipole creates a radiative field. That radiative field to first order approximation at each point in this uh, polarizable pair it creates a little dipole current of its own. And this, this dipole current, well, it creates its own field. It creates another radiative field. And that radiative field is the second order. Well, then it also creates a second approximate, uh, second polarization. And if you kind of continue this process out until self-consistency, then you see that the total solution, your, your final solution to this, so you have some incoming electric field, it polarizes this object, so it creates uh, a scattered of, uh, like field. Well, that can be described by this total polarization current. That's the self-consistent polarization current generated between the object, acted on by the background Green's function. So that's the Green's function here for free space, the Green's function for the, the problem that you know, basically the, the solution that you know, in terms of some kind of polarization current. This total current obeys some scattering relations centered around the T operator. And what the T operator does is because all of these actions are done by linear operators, it kind of says that there exists a linear operator that maps between any given initial field and a total polarization current for the object such that this description would be true. And this T operator, this mapping, obeys a relationship that has to do with the geometry of the object, which is captured in this IS here. So that, that thing is, you can think about it as a projection into the scatterer. And then properties related to not the scatterer, but the material that it's made of. So this is, this is kind of lifted out. All the information about the geometry is captured in, in this projection scatterer object. Information about the material susceptibility of the object and the Green's function. And if I put in another T operator, so if I put in um, the adjoint from, from the left-hand side, then the fact that this T operator is only described within the body itself means that my entire relations of physics can be described in terms of the vector T, the small vector T, resulting from a given incident field. Why is this useful? Because now all of our constraint relations for physics are given in terms of this quantity T, this total polarization current, 
that can be also used to describe our objectives. So for optimization theory, this is really nice. When you when you frame a problem in terms of optimization theory, the mathematicians usually have some kind of design variables, and these design variables are subject constraints. Once we phrase things in this way, T here acts as our design variable, and the constraints of physics are also given in terms of T. So it's just a nice way to put it in a formalism that works well with a lot of existing literature and mathematics. Okay, so interlude over. The second relaxation that we then do uh, in our problems that we looked at is duality. So once we have these, these T operator relations, that, that's why we talked about them, then the entire physics of Maxwell's equation is captured in these quadratic functions. So quadratic functions because for a given projection, for a given choice of, of where I project into the body, this is just a real number. And this projection is can be used exactly like what I was talking about in the first class. So choice, these choices of volumes, these choices of I want physics to be right on average over some kind of domain. The second part is that possibly introducing additional auxiliary fields that are also described in terms of quadratic functions. I can then describe all of the different objectives, all of the different applications that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, I introduced all these things, experience, light trapping, these sorts of things. They're all kept captured by quadratic functions of this T vector also. So then we have quadratic constraints for quadratic objectives. And our total optimization problem becomes a quadratically constrained quadratic program. Uh, for these QCQPs, there is a very nice relaxation on your Lagrangian that lets you find bounds. So we've done, we've already made our problem simpler by possibly averaging through our physics. The next thing that we can do is we can say, well, I'm not even going to worry about solving this problem exactly. I'm going to do a heuristic that gives me a bound on this simplified problem. So I kind of have, already have two norms um, that I'm controlling. And the idea is that it all comes from the, the special structure of the, the QCTP, just what makes this easy, is that if you have this quadratically constrained quadratic program structure, both your objective, this, this Q with a little O here, and all your constraints, the Qs with the Ks, well, if you look at this sum, this is an affine function in terms of your, your multiplier values for your Lagrangian, and it's quadratic in your control parameters or in your design parameters, which for us is this total polarization term T. So the sum of this thing in terms of T is also just a quadratic function again. It's another quadratic function T given by the sum. And that means that I can perform this transformation where I take, instead of you know doing the correct way of, of solving a Lagrangian and working out the correct multiplier values to make sure that all my constraints are satisfied, I can just give some set of multiplier values to begin. And I can find for that set of multiplier values, the optimal T. And that's, that turns out to be a very easy problem because this whole structure, this whole function is quadratic. So this new function as a function of my multipliers is always a bound. And I'll kind of show why that is in a second. And the second nice thing about it, the whole reason why we do this relaxation is that it's also convex. Um, if you don't know what convex means, for the purpose of this talk, it just means very easy to solve. It means that as an optimization problem, this thing can be solved by any algorithm you choose, whether or not it'll be fast, that's a different question. But you're always guaranteed that if you have some kind of descent method, it's gonna go to the right spot. You don't have to worry about probing the different landscape, when you optimize it and it finds a minimum or maximum, that is the minimum or maximum. So we now have something that's always a bound that we can then optimize in the reverse way. So we're trying to minimize our bound for a maximum function, maximize our bound for a minimum function. And this gives us an interesting connection. So we now have something, nothing or no object can do better than this bound. So this is a fundamental bound on the objective or the physics of the problem. So just to give you kind of a, a little pictorial idea of what's going on here, when we're doing this duel and we're taking the supremum, what we're doing is we're kind of 
In this case, we're, we're finding the, the minimum or maximum over a sheet. So we have this kind of just simple Lagrangian. So we have one constraint here. Um, <clears throat> on the one constraint, for the, for the two variables, x1 and x2, that satisfy the constraint, the value of mu that I pick doesn't matter at all, right? Because on these values of x1 and x2 that satisfy the constraint, the constraint is zero. So the function is actually completely independent of, of the value of mu. So we see that as we vary mu through some different set of values, these kind of overall sheets, these overall quadratic functions of this Lagrangian change, but they always intersect along these lines that are the lines where the constraint is actually satisfied. And the idea is that by changing the value of mu, we might hit on a spot where the sheet actually has its maximum it's, that happens to correspond to one of these points. So it's kind of like we're allowing our optimization to, to vary over this whole space of x1 and x2 instead of being confined to the submanifold of the constraint. And that makes our optimization problem really easy, right? We don't have to worry about what the specific shape of this thing is. We're just optimizing over the whole space. And that, that's very nice for us. But on this special line, we know that the value of, of mu doesn't matter. So when we allow it to explore this space, if it happens to find some other point where our constraints are not satisfied, well, that means it's already kind of taken these points into account and that the, the thing that it chose is better than whatever happens along this submanifold. So this is the idea and this is why this is about. Some kind of remarkable points before I uh, close by looking at some interesting examples for, for nanoatomics. It turns out that this optimization perspective amalgamates many different things that were done previously in inverse design to, to give bounds. So previously, it was often done arguments about mode counting, arguments about what can be done for a specific mode. This actually has a really nice correspondence to a lot of things that were done previously and is sort of like taking the different arguments that were done individually and bringing them together at one time. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit vague about that because the connection is slightly technical to explain. But if you're interested, please uh, check out this attached reference. Uh, it's just, yeah, Google mind. The, the second thing we found is that a few constraints are often good enough. So if you're just interested in terms of the performance, I talked about this picture of physics. Well, it turns out that we only need to impose a few carefully selected constraints. And that tells us very accurately what the performance will be. So we'll show that in a second. And, and actually, from the perspective of optimization, so that, that's in the, from the perspective of how many constraints we need to propose, in the end, what happens when we do this optimization is that it's actually equivalent to proposing one single constraint. So when we find that there's a really good correspondence between inverse design and these bounds, it actually means there's one quadratic constraint that exactly explains why performance is the way it is. So this is kind of interesting from learning about what's going on in these objectives. Why do we get performance that we get? From the more practical perspectives, it gives sets a nice benchmark for inverse design. So these problems, as I said, recurring what kind of performance can we, we hope for? When should my program stop? As long as these bounds are fairly accurate, it does a very nice job of answering these questions for you. And even if it's semi-accurate, well, at least you have some kind of idea, which is better than nothing. It can be used to show the influence of design choices. So we can introduce different fabrication constraints, different choices of material, different choices of volume, and look much more rapidly at how this changes the values of the design to see how this affects overall performance instead of just you know putting this in the computer and seeing what kind of things happen. And um, it can be potentially integrated with standard inverse design methods. So this hopefully I'll talk about a little bit at the end. This is where I'm working right now, trying to use this dual information to improve inverse design. Okay. So now enough of the theory, I'll show you some examples and hopefully <laughs> you have some background in nanophotonics, these things will be interesting to you. Uh, the first one that I wanna show 
briefly is bounds on far field scattering cross section. And so these are done with only two constraints. So I'm only uh, constraining that real and reactive power have to be conserved. So this is over the whole domain. This scattering relation must be true. And this is a direct correspondence with this idea of reactive power that comes up in electrical engineering and real power. And the difference between the two bounds are shown between the solid and dashed line. So dashed lines are only real power, nothing to do about phase. Solid lines are real power plus information about phase. And uh, these bounds are actually much better than anything that had been done in the field previously. And they answered a question about what happens in these intermediate regimes. So when you have the kind of, I guess, transition between dipole approximations and far field solutions. So we know that at a certain point, well, geometric office is, is true. And we kind of know that these answers, what the answers are in that case. We know that the scattering cross section eventually has to become the geometric cross section. Uh, when the object is very small, we also know um, answers for metallic particles when they're on resonance. And we have this Rayleigh solution. And what the optimization says is that these are optimal solutions. These are actually the maximum scattering cross section that you could ever get happens with these resonant metallic particles. And if you have a dielectric, when it's off resonance, the Rayleigh response, that's exactly the maximum response you look for. And as you transition in between, well, what does this look like? It looks like these bounds. And how do we know that? Is because when we actually do inverse design, so that's all these little dots uh, in green for the green curve over here and pink for the pink curve over here, we see that there's not really much difference between what comes in inverse design and what comes up in the bounds. So that's not to say that we know that the bounds are accurate for, for these real and reactive power constraints. It's not to say that we can't do better than this, but we know that the true optimum lies somewhere in between this bound and the dot. And so we know that the bounds aren't that far off, that this is very, very close. And we also see interesting things. So like when you put in the criteria that you have to have this phase information, this reactive power, you get the appearance of resonance gas. So this allows you to predict, okay, if I need to enhance my cross-section with a dielectric, where exactly does this have to be? That may seem like an easy problem, but it's only an easy problem when you know the geometry specifically. And these are bounds for any geometry that can fit inside um, of all of this given size. And predicting when can I have a mode at all for something given size, that, that's me. Here is a similar example for absorption of periodic gratings. And again, we see that the bounds track pretty nicely with what comes out of inverse design. And they predict these really rapid transitions for the appearance of leaky modes determined by periodicity and are very useful for, for setting up um, yeah. what are the kind of parameters that I'm going to need in my inverse design optimization if I need to get some kind of component performance. I'll just be very brief on this. Uh, the one that I think is more interesting is our is our recent results concerning the local density of states. So unfortunately, these are now in 2D. I'm working on the 2D code. Then it's, uh, it's been a work in progress. But this is something very interesting in terms of a finite bound for the local density of states. So this is that kind of cell enhancement. This is the kind of gold standard of nanoponics is this how large can I get the local density of states? And there's been long-standing questions about can this thing be infinite? Can I get infinite enhancement at least within the validity of the framework for nanoponics? We know that eventually other processes kick in and won't let you get an infinite enhancement of uh, light matter interactions. But within this framework, how large can the answers be? And it seemed like, well, maybe, maybe it's infinite. Without uh, having any width on your source, the answer is still infinite. But as soon as we add a finite bandwidth to our source, with these bounds, we find that the system saturates. So as I keep growing my system, I'm thinking here about a little dipole, and then we have some small air gap, and then around it, a medium that has to fit within an L by L 
size square and I can structure it however I want. Well, how large can I get the density of states? These are all done, I believe, for a lossless material with a chi of five. And for different values of the line of the source. So this Q factor is given here by our center frequency that, um, divided by two over the line width. And depending on this value, we see that the possible enhancement of the local density of states, the possible enhancement of our total electromagnetic interaction strength between the dipole and the surrounding medium, it, it saturates. It does not continue to grow with system size. Uh, it goes to a finite value, and this finite value obeys some kind of very almost simple analytics in terms of the line width of the source and the line width of, of the mode, of the line width of the possible mode achievable up until this cutoff value. Again, what's interesting about this is not so much that this analysis works. Um, in the end, I guess it is interesting because you can't say for sure that you know this analysis will work. This is like a single mode analysis. It's not at all clear that the best way to optimize the local density of states is in terms of a single mode when your available volume grows very large. But it shows you that this is true. And then once you know that it's true, it's very true. Uh, we can also do interesting things or kind of like future looking ideas. So there's been thoughts about trying to do optical computation, about trying to put scattering structures to do math kernel operations. So can we do integration? Can we do differentiation? We know we can do a Fourier transform already. We can generalize this idea into other kind of um, all optical processes that we can run on computers. So here's the idea of implementing a uh, Volterra in integral kernel. There's a lot of choices to make with this, with this example, and so we're only really exploring one here, but at least it's uh, interesting the results nonetheless. So we have a plane where we're putting a bunch of dipoles, and this has a small separation, from, uh, and then we have a what we call an input plane. So here we look at all the different fields resulting from these dipoles. And the number of channels is the number of dipoles that we, we put on this line. And as the number of channels grows, the space in between the dipoles shrinks. On the output side, we put an output plane again. So both these things are a quarter wavelength. And we say, well, what we want is that this field on the output plane is the integral of the field along the input plane. This is our objective. And uh, mathematically, it's described down. What we find is that. Inverse design for, for a real part of susceptibility was two. This is for a design domain of a half wavelength thick, thick by two wavelengths long. It does very, very poorly. In fact, it's, it's almost no better than that. And <laughs> we find that that kind of bears out. That makes sense in terms of the bounds. We find that the bounds are, are not far off what can be done by inverse design within an order of magnitude. And these are not done for kind of the maximum number of clusters is the maximum number of volumes that we could possibly impose. So again, this is getting down to the idea of how much physics do I maintain? That's the number of clusters that I'm using to follow. So that's the number of divisions of this rectangle sitting in the clusters. And uh, the solid line is just done again with one. So that's again, just the conservation of real reactive power. And then when the number of clusters goes up, that's subdividing this rectangle and putting on more constraints. When we go to real part of chi equals 10, we find there's a very rapid transition. So at first, there's some disagreement between what happens between the inverse design and what happens during the, with the bounds. So when you have two dipoles very far apart, the bounds say you should be able to do quite a bit better than inverse design, whether you can or not, it's still open debate. But as the number of channels grows, you see that there is a rapid transition to where the, both the bounds say that uh, you can't do very well. You can't actually make this, this integration kernel happen. It doesn't work. It's going to be a very large error. And that's also what you see in the first design. So kind of showing you exactly what the maximum transformation capability of a medium of this size with this susceptibility value is. Or this OK, so to close, uh, where are we going with this? Well. We have all this interesting information now about duality. 
And it seems to be very, very close to what we've seen in inverse design. So the question then becomes, can we, can we use this to actually improve our inverse design results? So can we kind of couple the inverse design together with bounds and have one inform the other to kind of ratchet our way up to, to bounds and inverse designs that are, that are both almost optimal? We don't exactly know if this can be done yet, but we have some very good indications. And what we found so far that why this is possible. So I started off this talk by saying that this design problem, this decision problem is really hard, that, that it's this empty hard class. And that, you know, this means that if you had an efficient way to solve these problems exactly, you could solve any decision problem. So, so what's going on here? Well, we found that there's this conservation, this conservation of reactive or resistive power constraint uh, gives you, when you impose it, it gives you a compact domain. And that's not generally true of this whole class of um, decision problems. So there's kind of some special structure that can be present in our design problems depending on what you impose. And if you choose to impose um, this conservation of resistive power, which seems like a natural thing to do, and it's sensible. We often find that power is a very reasonable thing to, to want to conserve. It tells us a lot of information. Then you can impose this Scion's mean max theorem. And what this says is that the order of operations uh, can be interchanged. So when I was talking about this dual, I was always doing this operation. I was always trying to take the maximum for a given multiplier and then minimize in terms of my multipliers. But when you have the presence of this condition, which is not generally possible, you can interchange these two things. And through some math that's uh, described in this article, if, if you're inclined, this switch of orders allows you to prove that if you're allowed to alter your design objective, so if you're allowed to say, okay, I'm gonna change my design objective a little bit. I'm gonna keep all the constraints. I can actually find optimal solutions. So this gives you a new way to look at inverse design. There's, there's some other different alterations you can also look at that are interesting. But the idea here is that normally in inverse design, you say, okay, I have a problem that, that's very hard and I don't know if I can solve it. So here's a solution that gets part of the way, it respects all the physics, but I don't know if it's optimal. What I could do instead is I can look at one, I can say, well, I only want to resolve part of the physics. So here on the, on the left-hand side, we're kind of looking at a, a structure as we, as we do these different, we kind of increase our resolution. We impose more and more constraints on the physics. It gets tighter and tighter. It starts to approximate the structure better and better. The first thing I can do is I can say, well, I only want part of these physics for the objectives. Well, in that case, I can often find an ultimate structure. And then the second question becomes, well, that, that thing is not yet physical. What do I do with that? The part of science theorem tells you that as I get more and more physical, as long as I'm allowed to change what the objective was a little bit, I can actually always return to optimal structures. So it rephrases the problem of not solvable problem. Here's a, here's a device that gets part of the way to Here's an optimal device for an objective that you didn't ask for. And then the question will be how close these objectives that you didn't ask for are to your original objective. And this is some of the work that we're doing now. Okay, so with that, uh, I just like to mention that we're definitely not the only group working on this. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting work going on in other places. So some of the big names, uh, Matt Christensen's group. Uh, the group of Milena Vukovic and the group of Owen Miller have been heavily involved in the field also since uh, the class. With that, I'll close. And yeah, thank you very much. Happy answering questions. So, so I don't know if um, uh, maybe you can repeat on Zoom, or, but uh, just this is my pedestrian understanding. First, you told us that there are symmetries to the problem. And they're not good guides, forget it. I'm going to tell you a better way. Then you introduce constraints that that, opt, that find the optimal solution better. 
Now, can I think of these constraints as generalized symmetries again? So, so are, didn't you effectively teach me that there are other <laughs> symmetries in the problem that I should be maybe aware of? Or, or is that a, not the right way to think about it? The, I guess the, the thing that it comes down to is what you say the symmetry is. So if we say this is like a kind of spatial structure or generated by some group relation, then the constraints that we add are just projections onto the space. They, they don't necessarily have anything to do with kind of like a, a generator of a group or any, any kind of connection like this. They are more to do with specific points in the problem that are related to the actual spatial construction. So they might be symmetric in some cases, and it's certainly reasonable that, you know, in certain cases, symmetries are very useful constraints, but in other problems, they need not be. So the constraints that we introduced are not generally symmetries, but they certainly could be. So, so maybe, so if you say that one of your constraints is power, uh -huh. am I right to say that this is effectively like a narrow band of estimation? Because if I have a broadband response, power is not probably the, the, the constraint that I want to keep, especially with nonlinear interactions. Right. So we are typically, or at least in the examples I was looking at, are working at one frequency. Okay. Uh, and then in nonlinear cases, we would work at just the probably two frequencies that would be the extent of our model. In certain cases, we can also generalize to the complex plane. In which case, this idea of conserving power becomes a broadband quantity. Um, so, I don't know if you really call that constraint of conservation of power anymore, but it's the extension to the complex plane of what would be the conservation of real power for a specific point on the real number line. This only works for certain objectives. So, not all objectives are analytic. So, sometimes you have to make an approximation about your objective. However, our constraints are analytic. And so you can always impose these kind of broadband or time constraints that have direct correlations. And the one that's very interesting, um, as far as we understand it from the perspective of why these problems are working well through compactness, are always the ones that are related to this conservation of real power constraint. So those, it's always this constraint that, that somehow limits the total magnitude of the fields in your problem, that seems to be what makes this approach tick. That seems to be the, the core property of why it's important. It's just in quantum optics, in quantum optics, you have mainly row relations, which are mainly concerned the number of particles. So I, I have this field versus particle interesting discussion here that I cannot put my finger on. So, so in the case, I, Maybe, maybe this will be a little bit helpful. So we, we adapted this to nonlinear, very like first initial trial of second chronic generation bounds. And in that case, in order to get a compact constraint, you have to consider both frequencies simultaneously. So it's kind of like you can only consider power being conserved as the interaction when taking into account both up conversion and down conversion processes. And how you know you have something that drives your system and some ways for energy to exit. And you have to describe all those things together before you get the right. Thank you. There is a question from the uh, Zoom audience. And it uh, is uh, how much computer power is needed to perform this research? And it is from uh, the room in uh, the University of Montreal. Okay. So it varies uh, a lot depending on what, what you actually want to do. Uh, let, me, let me be a little bit more specific with that. The inverse design is very computationally intensive and it's computationally intensive because Maxwell's equations in 3D are computationally intensive. That's, that's the important step is just applying the Maxwell operator. If we had a fast way to do that, then this would all be fast, but we don't. And so, that, that's our rate limiting step sort of thing. When we only apply a few constraints to our problem, it's very, very fast. So this is like laptop level power. You can do these bounds in well, coding. It takes a long time, but once you've coded it, 
you can do the bounds in you know under a second sort of thing for very very large objects. So this is interesting because we have almost a perfect agreement when we get up to this geometric optics limit of what you can do or for very large objects between maybe one or two constraints and what comes out of inverse design. So it's almost like these things are, you know, extending this idea of duality to two sides, to two sides of something. That as this object gets bigger and bigger, actually the number of constraints that you need to predict its performance become fewer and fewer, and you can get the bounds really, really quickly. The challenging part is to implement more constraints. So as the number of constraints goes up, your computational needs go up. That's kind of our key bottleneck. And exploring this in 3D is yet to be done. So um, for doing a pixel level bound, so kind of imposing exactly the same constraints as you would on the inverse design, the amount of time is, is the same as doing an inverse design. Okay, thank you. I believe it has uh, responded to the question. So we have maybe time for last question. So you talked about the uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation going in and electromagnetic radiation going out, but sometimes, like for example, in photo emission, what comes out can be an electron and you know, or a particle instead of like a photon. And I wonder if these kind of techniques that you've developed are also useful for those other problems. Okay, yeah, so it's always it's always a little bit dangerous to answer these questions because I don't know. I haven't done it, so could be could be not useful because of reasons that I'm not aware of yet. But at least in principle, it can work. So it all depends on on how you can set up your optimization. Really, what I've described, if, if you look at it from kind of a theory level, is sort of like, mean field approximations or kind of like reduced physics models together with framing it as quadratically constrained quadratic pro programs. This framework of quadratically constrained quadratic programs is complete. So in principle, any optimization can be framed as one of these programs. How exactly you do that and the tricks you'll need to play, uh, that depends problem to problem. So in a way, yes, it, it will work. I have no idea how well it will work. Uh, and it would come down to the specifics of, you know, what is this interaction between the electromagnetic field and the matter look like? How complicated is this thing? What kind of physics do we need to describe to get compact constraints? Uh, is this possible? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> sorry, I can't be more precise without having a specific problem in mind. Okay. okay. Okay, so if uh, there is no other question, I would like to thank uh, Sean very much for okay, his you. presentation. And I believe he will be available for face-to-face -face discussions uh, whenever you want to talk to him. So send him an email, come here or discuss with him directly. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, everyone.